Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. Today, we're talking about the portrayal of climate change in film and television. And I've got two guests. First, Pam Riddlemeyer. We met on Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes when I was an AD and you were a camera assistant. Like me, you've since left the business and now you're a postdoctoral scholar of science governance at UC Davis. Nice to see you again. Good to see you, Skid. We're also joined today by Ray Binstock, playwright, screenwriter, story consultant, and co-writer of the Climate Storytelling Playbook, recently published by Good Energy. Ray, welcome to Below the Line. Hi, thanks for having me. Glad to have you both. So we're going to talk more about Good Energy and the Climate Storytelling Playbook later in the show. But let's start with the big picture. Tell me about the need for a discussion around climate change and how Hollywood and the film industry are part of it. I mean, the need is the same as the need for discussion about anything that uh, needs representation. Climate change is a very real thing that we're all dealing with. But, you know, in some ways it is so scary. Not only is it so scary, but it's very scientifically complicated. And we've seen people in the on the denial side use that as a way to discredit it. But for a long time, even though we've known about this for a very long time, it's benefited everyone to keep it out of the conversation because it is depressing, it's scary, it's uncertain, it's all the kind of things that, you know, often that we want resolved. Just on TV, we want a resolution and the climate change, the climate crisis does not have that easily. So uh, Hollywood has been very reluctant to include the climate crisis. Good Energy actually uh, did a study um, that looked at all scripted content between, I think, 2016 and 2020 for the phrase climate change, and then I think 36 related keywords, and found that around 2% of all scripted media involved mention of climate change or those those keywords. And then I think like 0.5% included actually climate change. That lack is extremely, extremely noticeable once you take a look for it. Wow. Now, yeah, Ray, we're going to talk more about what Good Energy's done and the effort being made here. Pam, let's take a moment where you talk about your personal journey going from film into the study of science and climate change. Well, I worked, uh, as you know, for over a decade as a camera person, working on films, traveling around, seeing how people live in different environments. I, I filmed a lot in uh, harsh environments and seeing how people are dealing with the environment getting warmer and getting wetter or getting drier, depending on where you are and when you're there. And I just, I became really interested in the science behind it all. I was still a crew person. I uh, had an undergraduate degree, but had never gone to grad school and uh, wanted to know more. So I ended up starting off taking some biology classes and marine biology at a community college. After spending years as a film person, I didn't know if I could, if I would like being back in school, but I loved it. So uh, after a semester at community college, I ended up going back for a master's degree and then a PhD. And that's my journey into science. I come into the academic field with obviously a different background than most academics. And I think that it really gives me a different perspective. And I know that it's possible, even if you aren't a scientist, to understand the science. You know, I, didn't, I don't really consider myself an academic. I, I still feel like I'm a crew person in a lot of ways because that was so many of my years spent on sets, moving equipment around and, and dealing all, with all the things we deal with on set. But it's possible to read some of the science reports and understand them if you just are interested and spend the time and ask questions. When I first started back in school, I was just asking questions all the time. I was asking scientists, why does this happen? You know, what's, what's behind this? And really, uh, it's possible. You know, I, I don't think you have to think of yourself as a scientist to understand the science. You just have to be curious and ask questions. Ray, I'm also curious about your journey into activism and merging it with your work as a screenwriter. I think that climate change is omnipresent, especially in my generation. Most people my age became aware of climate change and what it meant for our future you know, as kids or as teens, and it's a major thing to develop around and to kind of square with all of the stories that, you know, we human beings learn uh, what to expect for our futures from the stories around us, from the stories that we ingest. And 
when you have all of these stories about what it means to be an adult, what it means to have a family, what it means to have a career. And then climate change is this thing that is, you know, ostensibly going to change a lot of what we take for granted right now. And you feel as though all of these stories that were supposed to prepare you for what the future will be like are now uh, obsolete. I started writing, I've always been a writer, but I started writing about climate and being interested in writing about climate because I have no power over what will happen, but the uncertainty is something that I can at least explore. And it's something that I can, you know, in the tiniest ways, you can start trying to figure out what your suggestions would be about how to face this and working up with your own ideas and meeting other people of similar ideas. I mean, Octavia Butler, one of the greatest climate writers of all time was writing decades ago. And so much of what she's written has absolutely come true to an absurd degree. But even if you feel it doesn't feel like a world saving thing to do right in this moment, it's still writing about climate and being involved in climate activism are extremely important things right now, every moment of the day. Well, take me inside the conversation that is taking place. So for people who might not be part of this Hollywood community, what's happening with writers and directors and other folks who are concerned about these issues and working in the film industry space? People are at a crossroads because on the one hand, a lot of people do recognize the importance and the urgency of talking about this. And not only the importance as a, as a moral obligation, but you know how much there is to be mined in terms of story in terms of entertainment, in terms of pathos. So people want to write about this. And they also, audiences want to hear about it. You know, audiences don't want to feel alone with climate change. They want to see it represented in the characters that they love and relate to. But on the other hand, a lot of writers feel stuck, whether it's because they feel like they can't, you know, if they want to write about climate, then they can't write anything else. Like if they are interested in romance, if they're interested in fantasy, if they're interested in cultural stories, you know, they can they can either write those things or a climate story. Or some writers feel like they, in order to write a climate story, they have to know everything. You know, they have to be experts in a scientific field or like, you know, Pam, as you talked about, but they have to be like academics. And that's not true, but it's one of those situations where before anyone's really started doing it in a major way in Hollywood, everyone is scared to because they're scared to be the first one to do it and to really get it wrong. Which is not to say that there haven't been some people who have done great climate storylines, you know, already. There's uh, Madam Secretary on CBS was a great example of doing multiple climate storylines. There's That's a big part of, like, the last season of The Affair, you know. And, and in the playbook, we have a lot of case studies of modern climate mentions. But it is still very, people move away from it because as storytellers, they don't want to feel chained to one specific message. And, I, and they also, I think, feel very overwhelmed. And when it comes to being able to like integrate climate into the stories they already want to tell. Now, Pam, I know you attended a Hollywood Climate Summit last summer. Talk to me a little bit about what that conversation was like. It's been going on for, I think, three years. This was the third year now. It happens usually in June. It's a place where a lot of youth come together with screenwriters, with environmental scientists. They talk about uh, how to put climate stories into screenwriting. And there, this year, there was a great session where we looked at, uh, we got to choose our breakout room. You know, one of them was The Sopranos, which was the one that I went to because I worked on the pilot of The Sopranos many, many years ago. So I wanted to add a climate story into The Sopranos. And uh, that was a lot of fun. So, you know, we just spent about an hour there talking about different ideas of how they could have brought climate into a Sopranos episode. This year, it was both virtual and in person, and, and I went to the virtual sessions, and there were some great speakers. There were a lot of Indigenous storytellers telling their stories, which is really an important part that we need to include in screenwriting as well, in my opinion. Well, as we talk about integrating climate issues into story, Ray, you mentioned the playbook earlier. Talk more about what the climate storytelling playbook is all about. It's a collection of studies, resources, interviews, and really just a comprehensive kind of deep dive into what goes into successfully writing about climate. Playbook is the brainchild of Anna Jane Joyner, who, you know, comes from an activist background. And so she's been having these conversations in the nonprofit world for a very long time and in the on the local government, state government, federal government levels 
what I think she did that was really brilliant is she really set out to get as many different experts as possible and then had me and Carmiel, these, you know, two screenwriters, she uh, worked with us to figure out how to take all of this incredibly important information and phrase it in a way that is directly related to dramatic writing. And the playbook talks about about uh, climate psychology and different ways that people deal with it, different things it does. You know, they talk. We talk about that in terms of character. The playbook talks about you know specifically about water and climate migration and plastics, and it does those always with suggestions of how that could spark a story or you know, the role that that could play in a story you already have, how that might shift things. And so the playbook is all of this really great information, but it is all filtered through the lens of how does it make a good story? How do you get objectively exciting, relatable, authentic, you know, funny, just well-formed storytelling? So I think it was very engaged when I visited the website because uh, to your point, Ray, you take these uh, short little bios, for example, of characters and how climate change is affecting them. And you can see where the story would go. And it was very inspiring, just kind of flipping through. And it's not just sort of, this is how you write it, but really you engage with the reader in a way that ideally sparks their creativity. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, we don't, Pam, you were talking about putting the climate into the Sopranos and stuff like that. Like we do that as an exercise and talk about stuff like that because we don't want to be prescriptive. We don't want to tell people this is the right way to write a climate story because there are so many different right ways to write a climate story. And it's not about, did I check X, X, and X off the list? And, you know, does I do I deserve to write a climate story now? It's about finding a seed of an idea and running with it. Or having an idea that you like going with, um, you know, a concept or a story you already have and being like, oh, you know, I could bring climate in in this way. I could do this twist. I could do it in this episode or I could have this character struggle with this. And so we, the point of the climate storytelling playbook is never to, you know, sit you down at a desk and like grab your hand and like write with the pen for you being like there once was a like we really want to kind of tantalize you with the city of like, oh, this is possible, and then really back off so that, you know, your brain can be free to go wherever it wants to. Now, Ray, you mentioned a couple of storylines that uh, had uh, engaged with climate change. I'm curious from either of you if there are other examples of where you think things have been successful or you see shows that, wow, maybe that was a missed opportunity. I would say that for years, up until recently, what we saw mostly were the doom and gloom stories. Really, I mean, there's so much academic literature on the doom and gloom narratives of climate change and how it just really either depresses people into thinking that it's going to happen, there's nothing we can do about it, might as well just do nothing, not even try. Or there's also the aspect that doom and gloom can lead people into denialism, fatalism, you know, all these different um, avenues that that can take people down, which are not productive at all. And the doom and gloom, we're talking about movies like The Day After Tomorrow or Waterworld or where we've gone to the extremes and people are dealing with as an extreme disaster. Well, I mean, climate change is a crisis. There's definitely scientific consensus on that, but it's already happening. So there are things that people are already living with and they're already adapting to it. They're already mitigating it. It is already happening. And it's also we're in a situation where the people who currently are and who will be most affected by it are almost across the board, people who are already disenfranchised. So I uh, mentioned the Madam Secretary storyline. One of the later ones has to do with the issue of trying to evacuate an island that is essentially going to be destroyed by climate change. And it's not an issue of get the inhabitants out of there for the duration of the storm and then bring them home. It's like this island's not going to exist anymore. You know, it's as much a political issue as it is a humanitarian issue. And I think that that's, you know, super important for people to understand because, all the, you know, if this was somehow free from politics, like we would have started dealing with this 15 years ago. If this were somehow free from all of the other major issues that show up that everyone has opinions on, we would be in such a different place. But, you know, I think there are like rather than missed opportunities, I'll say that there are some shows that are coming out right now that I think are so ripe for climate storylines. One of my favorite new shows that's come out is The Bear, which is, you know, about a, a restaurant in Chicago. 
And I mean, even this summer, the heat waves in the Northeast, the heat waves in the Southwest, like the heat waves in the middle of the country, these heat domes over big cities are going to become more and more common. They're going to start, they're going to happen in places. I mean, I'm from Massachusetts already where, you know, these are different falls and winters from my childhood in a noticeable way. That's only going to get worse. And so for shows that are set in that, you know, are, it doesn't have to be all about nature. Like it's most of it, when we see it, it's not going to be about necessarily like the kind of image of like a beautiful natural scene being ruined. It's going to be about established places with infrastructure that are now experiencing conditions that that infrastructure was not built to deal with. You know, like the bear, it's this great small story about these really amazing characters and this really complex emotional stuff. Throw a heat dome in there. Throw a blackout from that heat dome in there. How does that affect a restaurant? I think that we have so many, there are so many good shows right now that can and should make the effort to, you know, not become entirely about climate change, but start grappling with the reality that climate change is only going to become more and more part of our world. Five years from now, a lot of these things are going to sound weird. Remember, like, the, remember at the beginning of the pandemic, or maybe like six months in, where you'd watch something and there would be like a crowd scene and you're like, oh my God, they're all so close together and no one's wearing a mask. And it's, ah, it's felt so at odds with reality. I think that a lot of stuff in five to 10 years from now is going to feel exactly that same way. Because even though climate change was absolutely happening, people just weren't showing it on screen. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think a lot of the writers out there, they're very environmentally uh, mindful. You know, they're probably composting, they're, re- you know, reducing their use of plastic. You know, why why are we separating that from the characters that are being written? If it's a modern day character, it's like, everybody should be composting. You know? <laughs> they're in their kitchen and they have a compost bin. It's just, you know, adding some props in there sometimes, not even telling a story about climate, you know, just adding the behaviors that the characters do and making them more climate positive, you know, climate friendly. Instead of getting into a car, why can't the character jump on his bike or walk and have that be a part of the story as well? Yeah, I mean, we talk a lot in the playbook about, you know, demonstrating best practices and, and showing that stuff and normalizing it. And then there's also, when it comes to characters, you know, why can't a character who's a kid feel climate anxiety? Also, we talk a lot about, you know, shifting from the old standby of the pain in the ass vegan activist who wears a hair shirt and is like unpleasant you know the idea of making climate change and people who care about climate change the butt of the joke even i mean i love you know the west wing i've seen that show many times and i love it it's one of the most liberal shows in the history of television but also it mocked the environmentalist and climate movements for several seasons until finally it kind of started to, you know, like the rest of the world, it started to pivot. But, you know, in the same way that it's been so easy to mock feminists, turning the person who's concerned about climate change into a parody or into a nutty character, that is the kind of thing where like, there's funnier jokes to be made for one. And for another, those people are not only the truth tellers, but they're becoming the majority. Like all of Gen Z is like that, you know? So it just doesn't ring true anymore to punch down on people who are who care about this stuff because you will eventually be punching through water because you will be living underwater. Other examples of shows that are engaging with the issue? So there's a, an episode of Grey's Anatomy that has a heat wave that shuts down the air conditioning in the hospital. Ted Lasso has a whole episode about Sam Obasanya, the football player, refusing to go out in the field and shill for a sponsor that is also starting fires and and polluting in Nigeria. So, so far we're seeing climate show up like episode by episode in places and shows like years and years really dig into this stuff. And then also, I mean, there's shows that like Reservation Dogs, the premise isn't all about climate change, but there's no, is absolutely no separating the kind of various situations of indigenous folks in the country and the history there and the various struggles faced by all of these different groups. There's no separating that from climate change and extraction and the kind of just rampant exploitation of natural already occupied land that has been happening for the last 400 years. Oh, I did want to, so I wanted to bring up one other thing, which is um, 
something that I found interesting that we don't really talk about in the playbook, but uh, South Park, a decade plus ago, had that episode Man Bear Pig, where it was essentially making fun of Al Gore and An Inconvenient Truth and kind of saying like, he's making this thing up so he can get attention. And they did an episode much more recently that was essentially like, our bad, this was real. And I think that that is a very interesting example of part of what we're struggling with is the fact that like, this was a punchline for so long and has been a punchline. And the more that we slowly start understanding the absolute immensity of the crisis, the more people are struggling to integrate that into the flippancy that it's been treated with up until now. But that being said, I do think it's really important to say that one thing that we talk about a lot in the playbook and that I really believe in is that it is so possible to write a climate comedy and so possible to write a climate rom-com or a climate you know, heartwarming kids movie. We can't pretend that the future is going to be utterly devoid of joy and happiness and fun because of this. There's no point in human history where something so bad has happened that it's gotten rid of all happiness forever. Like that's part of what's so great about humans is that we've managed to keep on living through quite a lot of stuff. So I think that something that is, I would really like people to take home is the idea that you can write about climate in a way that not only doesn't look at the most, as you were saying, Pam, gloom and doom version of it, but that also can maybe help you feel better about what life is going to be like, that can maybe help you feel stronger, help you feel less alone, help you make peace with the reality of change. And yes, it's change that could have been avoided. It's change that is heartbreaking and it's loss that is heartbreaking. But at the end of the day, Deep down, all change is unavoidable and all change involves some loss and some gain. And I think that the sooner that writers start challenging ourselves to tell stories that don't just explore that loss over and over again, but also take the realistic look at like, even if we wish we didn't have to lose some things and gain others, since we are going to, what are we going to gain? So I think that's a very important part of climate storytelling and writing about climate in the modern Hollywood landscape. Well, and I think there's some value in, even for a non-writer, to visit the playbook that we talked about, to be able to sort of develop the sense of noticing when these stories are taking place in Hollywood and the store, and giving our viewing attention to stories that are properly representing climate change as well. Absolutely. Find comfort with the climate stories. The resources that are there, climate psychology resources, super helpful for me, just as a person not as a writer. The case studies in successful stories already, maybe you'll find a new thing to start watching. There's so much stuff there that doesn't have to hit you as a writer. It can just hit you as someone trying to figure out how to feel and think about the climate crisis. And where do people go for that? What's the website? Goodenergystories.com. Uh, another thing people can do is attend things like the Hollywood Climate Summit which happens every year, I believe it's in June. You can just search up Hollywood Climate Summit, get the website and register. There's also things like the Redford Center. The Redford Center has a lot of great webinars and anybody can sign up and watch them. And for writers, there's also the NRDC, which is a environmental nonprofit. They have something called Rewrite the Future and they have some good resources as well. After I finished my PhD, I finally was able to take a breath from being immersed in academic literature. And I thought about how to get in touch with some of my fellow filmmakers from my past. When I first started approaching people, writers and creatives who I know, and asking them, you know, why don't you put climate stories into your, into your work? I was getting just like blank faces and, oh, I don't know what to do. And that's just not my thing. So I started to become really obsessed with the idea of how do writers get in touch with scientists? I know the good energy has some links and some resources on there. But I also wanted to create a forum where my two worlds can combine. So I started a group on LinkedIn called Climate Change Storytelling. And I first started it just by networking my scientist friends with my filmmaker friends. It's just like a safe place where people can come together and have ideas about you know different things that are happening in the science world, what we're learning about climate change and different ways that people are adapting. I'm hoping that screenwriters and creatives will start to take some of those stories and implement those into their narratives. 
That sounds amazing. And I think that <laughs> we, we do have the library of experts, um, which is what you were talking about. We, you know, we put together a whole bunch of people. A lot of them we've worked with to create the playbook. And a lot of them are just really brilliant, awesome people that you know, Jane knows or has met. But honestly, in my experience of writing the playbook, academic, like there were so many scientists and academics who were just like so excited to talk about stories. They've been neck deep in this stuff for a really long time. And they're so into the idea of finding the human element in the science and vice versa. I think that there's so much rich possibility there for collabs. Yeah, I totally agree. I hope that more people visit my LinkedIn group. Yes. <laughs> we'll uh, put links both to the playbook and to the LinkedIn group on the website. Ladies, really glad you guys came on the show today. This is important stuff. Oh, well, thanks. Good. It was great seeing you again. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to have you both. On that note, we're going to call it a wrap. Listeners, I always appreciate your feedback. You'll find my contact info on our website, below the line, one word dot biz. My closing credits, thanks to Curtis Five for our music, John Juan for our logo, and all of our listeners, I appreciate you. Please rate us where you get your podcast. Tell your friends, oh, go vote next week. Thanks again from Below the Line. There is uh, Don't Look Up, which is, I think most people would think of thinking of a modern day climate story. That's a major one, which also is interesting because it's not uh, directly about climate change. You know, it's allegory. And in a way, it's interesting that the most successful to date climate story can't be about climate because that still feels too close to home. You know, it still feels kind of too hard to face, but it's a brilliant movie. Ray, I endorse pretty much everything you said, except uh, subject matter aside, I did not like Don't Look Up. I thought it was really not a very good movie, and I might have to edit that out. I'm not sure we're going to show for that movie on my show. but uh... <laughs> I saw it, did not like it, and was really just pissed that that was the climate change story of the year. As a climate change movie, totally off the mark, missed the mark to me. You can totally edit that out. Okay. <laughs>